Good morning, Amalia Holm. Welcome on VH Berries. Good afternoon, Victor. Thank you so much for having me. I am extremely grateful because as the date of today, we know that um, you can act, but also you are now a specialist into um, Irish rocks. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see that coming. I mean, you know what? I think so what Victor's referring to is that I posted a, uh, a picture on my Instagram story with some beautiful rocks that I found uh, on the shore here in Ireland where I am working. And I took a picture of them. And you know what? I think the one in the middle is a fossil. Is that how you say it? How you pronounce it? <laughs> fossil? You know, one of those ancient things. You need to tell me more about uh, this trip and this journey that you are making in Ireland. I don't know... Uh, What is the exact city, if it's Dublin or more into the countryside, but I would love to know more about it. Yes, uh, right now I am stationed in Dublin, but on the weekends I'm fortunate enough to be able to go around uh, the country a little bit. So I've been able to go to the northwest coast so far. So that's been very nice. Apparently I was to the, I went to, um, it's called Sleeve League, And it's the highest accessible sea cliff in Europe. Um, they're very proud of that. So that's why they keep saying it. So now I know it. Absolutely. <laughs> you're now repeating their marketing campaign. <laughs> right. And uh, you're actually uh, from uh, Scandinavia. So Norway uh, and Sweden. Uh, is it your first time uh, in uh, Ireland? It is my first time in Ireland. Yes. And I did not see myself going here. Um, it, Ireland was not really on my, you know, bucket list or in my in my plans. But I'm very happy that I've, I uh, this work brought me here because I'm enjoying every day of it. You just mentioned this word uh, work, Amalia Olm. Even true, uh, you cannot enter the details of the project, but you are actually here uh, not to spend your summer as a tourist, but also to create immersive content. That is the plan, yes. And I, like you said, <laughs> cannot say anything about this specific project, but it is so much fun and I can say that it's not, you know, it's it's not a lead, which means I have a lot of downtime and I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying that quite a lot. You know, there are ups and downs with depending on what kind of role you get. And for right now in my life, this was the perfect opportunity um, because it's a meaty role in the things that it is. It's partly physically challenging, but, you know, you're not like, You don't have the whole weight of the show on your shoulders, as you may, might feel when you're one of the leads. And Amalia Holm, if I can uh, trace a parallel, I would say that in this situation, if we were in politics, you would not be the minister, but maybe one of his assistants, which is... Uh, maybe better because you are not in the lights. I made this parallel with um, political science because this is one of your core passion. That's true. That's a great parallel, actually. Um, I've, <laughs> uh, I've studied uh, political science and I've been involved in Swedish national politics uh, a few years ago. And I did realize that the pressure of being in the spotlight, like politicians are, I don't know if it's my cup of tea. I think I would have to feel very, very confident uh, and convinced in what I'm doing to be able to do that. But I would love to someday maybe pursue a role as an advisor to a politician. Um, and then you never know. You never know. Maybe uh, that confidence would grow out of acting or so. On the other hand, I think it's just... Uh, Ideologically, I guess, I think actors and politics should stay far away from each other just because we don't want the wrong reasons for someone to follow you be just that you're charismatic, but rather, you know, your ideas resonating with their ideas and all that. So 
combining the two is still something that I'm, I'm not sure what I want to do with that. Uh, but I have my, uh, I, I did study political, a bachelor in political science at the Swedish Defense University, and I love doing that. And I think, uh, I'm pretty sure I'll go back, um, to have some master studies in that field as well. Um, maybe something along the lines of crisis management, um, or security policy, which was uh, my original major. Absolutely. And Amalia Ohm, to come back to what you just mentioned, I feel personally that for you, in your case, it makes sense to connect the two because um, it has been something that you followed even before acting, if I'm uh, correct, um, because at a very young age, um, you were... Uh, into a team in Sweden uh, for a very special political campaign. That is true. Yeah, I'm, that's true. I wouldn't just just be um, an actor who's trying to pursue fame in politics, um, um, but I would rather be, I mean, a politically interested and active person who also has then, the. I mean, which I guess most actors who go into politics, I don't think it, they, it just came out of the blue. I think I, I wouldn't, you know, distrust that they had a great intentions and a big interest probably their whole life. Um, so I feel like you need to be pretty um, convinced or at least uh, have spent a lot of time immersing yourself in those questions to be able to go that far. But, um, oh, I lost my train of, <laughs> of thought. That's perfect because uh, I was just going to to focus more on, uh, for example, what you've learned uh, during those studies in politics because uh, they can help you in every type of situation, even in acting. That's so true. And leadership under pressure, the way we, we studied like um, how leaders in the military deal under certain you know, very stressful situations and how you make, uh, how you make decisions. And something that I thought was very interesting was something called, um, oh, I'm translating this in my head now, but I guess it would be like, uh, risk awareness. Um, and yeah, just different, different studies on that. And I just always find it interesting to reflect within myself and in groups of people on how risk aware they are um if they like planning to try to you know um, um <laughs> to see if what risks can arise and then already solve them before they arise or if someone is a person who goes more with the flow and then they deal with the problem when it arises and in my mind i'm thinking that you know these different approaches are so different it's almost like you're either the one or the other and that kind of dynamic is probably uh, causing a lot of little friction in various groups of people um, whether that's your with your friends or you know it's, I, 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 I always find it fascinating whenever there's like little categories um, I can use to um, orient myself around people but of course, without trying to be too categorical or judgmental, uh, because just because I'm seeing three different categories arise in my head doesn't mean um, that they don't have nuances that I'm, you know, haven't, I'm inexperienced. Uh, I'm too inexperienced to see those nuances probably. So yeah, I'm excited to, to learn more throughout uh, the course of a, a whole lifetime. You're learning over the course of your lifetime and notwithstanding, I would say that Amalia Ohm, one of your first uh, law, for example, would be to um, <laughs> forbidden uh, rocks capture in the nature uh, to let the fossil in the nature. <laughs> Whoops. You don't think, is it not allowed to take one if you find one? I don't know. I haven't even thought about that. <laughs> if you find, <laughs> do you know, Victor? Is it? Is it? Maybe I should go put it back. 
I don't think so. It was just a, a funny idea okay. <laughs> that uh, uh, I gave you uh, in the case that you become uh, one day a politician. Yeah, that would be a skeleton, something that, you know, before they start writing about it, I'm going to come clear and I'm going to say this one time in Ireland, I couldn't help myself. I fell for these beautiful, beautiful rocks and I took them with me. And one of them happened to be a really cool false island. It's not my fault. Or maybe, are you supposed, oh, that's the thing too. We did read, you know, all in crisis management, especially there are these different methods and theories on how you should deal with um, being accountable for something when you're in, in charge or you're a public figure from a from the government or from a big company. And, and there, I, yeah, uh, I mean, there was no right or wrong. There was just different types so that you could guide someone or you can analyze which way they chose to go. If it's the scapegoat, just finding one person or one reason to blame. And then you have to, you know, get rid of that person because that way it looks like you've made progress, um, which is a classic uh, way to do it. Um, but it was also, you have to decide, are you going to admit that you did wrong and apologize and hope that they forgive you? Or are you going to deny that it was wrong and just stand by the fact that you did it? So I guess, Victor, you're giving me a good, a good, um, um, piece of homework there, uh, to sit and contemplate on whether or not I can stand by what I did or if I'm going to come back and apologize and regret it and compensate for it. I hope that after what I said, you will be able to sleep tonight and not uh, be you know, too uh, sad about those rocks. But <laughs> I would say that um, those nine rocks, there are more uh, rocks than there are seasons of motherland Fort Salem. Wow. Your transitions are epic. <laughs> that is true. There are <laughs> more rocks even in the hand of my, like in my palm. Uh, then there are more seasons, unfortunately, because we've been told and it's been official that season three of Motherland Fort Salem, um, the sci-fi fantasy show in an alternate America where witches run the military, um, that airs on Freeform and Hulu and Disney Plus and Amazon all over the world is, um, it's having its third and final season, um, premiering on Tuesday, uh, June 21st on Hulu, Freeform, and then the day after on Hulu. And then eventually it comes out to all the different distributors. But it, it saddens me uh, quite a lot because it has been the best project I've ever worked on. And it brought me to Canada, another country that I did not plan to go to. But because of work, I got to spend close to three years there. Um, and it was so much fun because that role was nothing I expected to to play, but, it, you know, it is a dream come true. I, I got to play a villain, a, a terrorist, and there's a lot to say. There's so many intricate and beautiful details about the, um, about this, the world in Motherland. Uh, but first off, it's just like someone who looks like me would be cast as the terrorist. Um, and I, I thought that was, uh, it was great when I first got cast in 2018, and I still think so. And I really, really think this is a, a, a great season that's coming out, um, the third season. Amalia Olm, if I understood correctly, um, this season three is coming exactly uh, at one day of interval, a year after the season two. Uh, and you just mentioned the fact that you spent three years in Canada. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about it? Did you record everything in one row? Um, yes. So very observant of you. I didn't even uh, connect the dots there that it's actually a year after the season two was released, but that makes sense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, so we made the pilot in 2018 and that was for the summer and then we all went back to where we came from because we were brought in from all over the world i'm from sweden and we had someone else from south africa someone from belgium uh, a few from the states and some from uh, other places in canada and then we just went home and we just <laughs> crossed our fingers and we're just hoping that this pilot would be picked up and it was and it was such a joy to find out that it was 
Then we came back in 19, 2019 to do the first season. And then we came back in 2020 to do the second season. And then in 2021 to do the third season. But the thing is that, of course, COVID hit. Um, so it ended up being much longer than anticipated. And that's why spending over three years, four years, I think, I spent close to three years there. No, that's probably an exaggeration. I think it's more like two years. Um. Reality is better than fiction because you just told me, Amalia Holm, that all of the actors and actresses came not only from America, but from all over the world. So all of those witches are coming from the four corners of our planet. Yes. And a cool thing about witches is that, you know, most culture, most cultures or probably all will have their own origin stories of what a witch is. And in Sweden, it's actually one of the more, I mean, being a, a pagan country, um, historically, it's one of the more dominating figures in our, in the remainings of those cultural holidays. Like for Easter, all the kids dress up as little Easter witches and they go knocking on people's doors. It's like trick or treat, uh, the American version, but, um, but this is the Swedish version where you say happy Easter and you get candy and, um, you preferably you made a little card with like witches and chickens on them and you hand it out to your neighbor. And, um, you do all of this with, you know, a broom, um, from the porch or something and, uh, you're about to, you say, bye, I'm flying off to Bluokulla, which is where the witches went, um, according to Swedish mythology. Let me think, Amalia Ohm, if people are handling <laughs> um, candies at Easter, maybe that they are handling uh, <laughs> chocolate eggs at Halloween. Yes. <laughs> yes, they probably, you know, they just re... They, they bought the, the <laughs> chocolate uh, companies or factories uh, probably just, you know, rewrap them um, and call them something else for Halloween because uh, it's kind of the same amount of um, candy being handed out. And I mean, it's probably because of the combination of we also had, of course, the Easter bunny or hare um, as well as other little uh, goblins and stuff back in the day. Um, so I think we've been picking and choosing and the little Easter witch and kids dressing up with freckles and, um, a scarf, a headscarf is, is what stayed in the culture. It stays in the culture. And furthermore, Amalia Holm, your character is called, uh, Sila, uh, Ramshorn. And I noticed that there is a lot of common letters in this uh, full name than there is in Amalia Holm. All the letters are here except I A M, which means I am. Wow. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> I love that detail. Thank you, Victor. Never thought of that. What is very fascinating about uh, season one and two that I saw uh, for the moment, and I'm very excited to see the, the upcoming season, is all of the uh, special effects, all the costumes, and all the atmospheres that gives um, a very special visual to the storyline. I agree. Yeah. One of the biggest things about Motherland for me was in the first season... That show was the biggest show I had ever worked on, like on scale wise and budget wise. So I, I found an old note in my, um, diary that said, uh, something about, um, that I had walked into the coffee table, the, the crafty table where they, you know, in between throughout the day, you can go there and you can have some coffee and a little bite of something, but it's not lunch. And uh, I had bumped into someone. I was like, hi, what do you do? What department are you in? And they said they were in the greenery department. And I was just <laughs> mind blown by the fact that there's a, its own department for just getting the fake plants to set and all of that. And, and that was, yeah, very, 
very cool. And um, yeah, just to get to work in a big studio and with a green screen and and all those things that that really challenge your fantasy. It's it's a it's a different kind of acting, but in a way, it's more like the acting you do when you're a kid, when you're just playing around because you need to use your fantasy because it's the things you're acting with are not there. <laughs> You just have to pretend to like pet the little dead bird because it's not there. And you can't, if they put in a real one, you can't touch it because then they can't cut in between. So that was a lot of fun. And um, yeah, this season is going to be quite CGI heavy as well because there's a lot of fantastical things happening. Um, and especially when it comes to the warfare, um, I think they make that, they make that look so good. On the show. Amalia Ohm, you just uh, discovered the greenery department, but have you ever heard of the rockery department? <laughs> no, I haven't. I have not. Uh, maybe you and I start the rockery department and uh, we make big success uh, on all the film sets throughout the world when we show up with a little palm of rocks that we found <laughs> stole from the Irish coast. <laughs> Indeed, it makes a lot of sense because you have a lot of free time right now. Yes, I do. I mean, it's not that much, really. It's just, um, I find at least that if I don't have a lot of mental pressure, um, then the time I have off will feel more than if there's little, if that makes sense. Because it's... Um, in a, way, in a way, it's easier for me to grasp what I need to do and learn the lines and learn the, uh, you know, do the character work that I need to do. It's it's easier to comprehend it. And so the time off will feel more, I'll be able to rest more in my time off when I have less responsibility. I guess that makes sense for everyone. Absolutely. And Amalia Ohm, I would love now to discuss and retrace a little bit of your journey, um, starting uh, from Norway to Sweden. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Mm -hmm. Yes, I was uh, born in, in Oslo, Norway, to a Norwegian father and a Swedish mother. And then we moved out of Oslo. We moved to Tunsberg outside of Oslo. Sorry, I'm just going to charge my computer. And um, uh, then when I was seven, we moved to Sweden um, to be closer to my mother's family because my father had passed. And yeah, they had planned to move to Sweden eventually anyways. But now after he, he passed, it felt like the perfect time to do it. And I, as a kid, I just loved the fact that I thought that I could speak Swedish. I mean, I knew the words and I understood all Swedish people I was talking to, but I probably had a pretty heavy Norwegian accent. Um, my <laughs> stepfather has told me that I did. I had no recollection of that. I remember one time when we went on a family vacation and I was about six years old, I think. And there was this, um, it was in, in Cyprus in the, um, the Medi um, Mediterranean, And there was this, um, like a kids group that you send the kids off to. And it was mostly Scandinavian kids. So there were Danish and Swedish and Norwegian that week there. And I was so excited about the fact that the Norwegians and the Danish and the Swedes didn't understand each other. And they, so the Norwegian kids didn't understand the Swedish, um, lead like the adult who was supervising us or playing with us and so I just grew so much into the role and took on the role of being the official translator of the whole kids group <laughs> and uh yeah I just thrived I loved that uh and like coming up with my own little translations and like so this is the word for that but it actually means this and I know this is similar to this word that you already know but actually the intention is this And I, at the time, I think I thought I spoke Danish too, because my best friend's uh, mother was Danish. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that was, you know, a little bit part of just loving the human connection and uh, getting in there. And it's kind of a little bit of being an entertainer too, I think. 
Um, I would also, you know, always be part of whatever show was being put up. If it's miming to a song or you sing your own song or you do a little dance number and all those things. I just loved doing that. And uh, then we moved to Sweden and eventually we moved to Stockholm. And I would be part of, you know, these um, like dance groups for kids and theater little groups for kids. But it was never, ever... Oh, yeah, and I went to choir school as well, um, which I loved. Uh, the only thing that bugged me was that I never got to sing a solo piece, and I always wanted to. Um, I remember one time when I was 10, and I was the, the reserve singer. Like, I, I was... Um, so it, it was for a Christmas concert, and we knew that if... There were two two girls who were going to sing solo, and if they got sick, we had to keep it a reserve, and I was reserved for one of them. And I just remember this weird feeling of feeling like, because uh, the one that I was reserved for, she said she had a sore throat the night the day before. And I remember this weird feeling, uh, the combination of thinking, you don't want your friend to be sick, but also if she's sick, I'll get to sing the solo, and that would be so much fun, but also nerve-wracking, because it would be in a big church and the whole school would be there. Um, yeah. And I remember that feeling very vividly that it's sometimes in entertainment, it's, um, it's only one person who can fill the spot. And, uh, I didn't end up really doing anything solo until I was 15, <laughs> I think. Uh, and that probably also made me, you know, more obsessed with, well, getting to do it and trying to be like, okay, I guess I'm not good enough or I'm not fitting these parts. What can I develop to, to, you know, to fit them and also try out different things. So it ended up when I was 15, I was actually doing an opera piece, um, La Chacchiopianga, which is like, yeah, a <laughs> classic, uh, Italian piece. Uh, and I was like, oh, I guess, so this is what I got to do to, to be able to sing a solo. I'll do this then. And then I was dead set on being an opera singer and I applied for this, uh, classical singing school. And I ended up being the f number one reserve again. Um, and this is when I'm 16 and I'm about to start secondary high school, which is called in Sweden. And, uh, I, I did, I was so upset that I didn't get in, that I was just the first reserve. And I didn't care what other schools to apply to. So I just let my mom and like, mom, you can decide what other schools I'm applying to because I just want to go to this opera school. Um, so she put in something in English and that sounded great, like social science in English. Um, so that's where I ended up going. But every week I would go to the other school and knock on the, on the door for the um, acceptance committee or whatever we called. And to, to ask, has someone's dropped out yet? Has someone dropped out? Why would they? It was the best school. So, <laughs> but uh, every week I was <laughs> hoping so, which was weird then when I was trying to make new friends at my other school. Cause I'm like, hi, very nice to meet you. I'm not going to go here. I'm just here cause I'm waiting to get into my real school. And then I never ended up getting in there. <laughs> so that's probably a weird first impression to make. Um, but I'm very happy that I went to the school I did go to cause um, I had a very nice and stimulating uh, time at that school. And you know, I was very involved in the student union and um, different associations. And I did, I did uh, play a part in a like low budget school musical. That was mostly for fun because uh, we weren't theater kids in our school. Um, so in a way, it just meant that I could be one of the few theater kids in a big school of non-theater kids instead of being at the best school with all the theater kids. So I guess it's just, you know, different journeys. And this was apparently my journey. <laughs> and then I was on an extras website throughout these years. Like, I think I put myself on that extras website when I was like 12, like very young. <laughs> and um, I never got any extra roles um, of background acting, that is, is the same as extra. And, um, sometimes I came, I got to come in for an audition for a commercial and I was so excited about it, but I never landed any of them. But then when I was 17, I just cut my hair, uh, very short, like not very short, but a, a bob, um, to my chin. And <laughs> I think that was helping me because that summer they had like a cattle call which is when you just send a like come audition if you want to um 
they're not really asking anyone in particular. They're just saying, oh, if you're this age, come audition. And I uh, went to this audition um, and it ended up being for a film where they needed a girl to play like 17 in 1940s, in the 1940s in Sweden. And my haircut was perfect for that. And I, I, I mean, I probably did a good job as well, but sometimes it's those little things that help out. And that ended and I booked it. And that was my first feature role in the, in the feature film, The Hidden Child. And that was just so much fun. Oh, it was, um, it was, it was such a cool experience because I, it was, you know, first time on a set and all of that. And I had just wanted to be on any kind of set for so many years in my little child perspective. That is, wasn't really that many years from an adult perspective, but it's all relative. Amalia Olm. We can see into uh, those legendary uh, early days that by being a translator, you had a lot of responsibility on your shoulders because uh, you were the person in the middle of the room or uh, if it was not in the middle of the room, in the middle of the classroom. <laughs> And um, in definitive, we can say that you have um, this passion for human connections i think so i think that's what it is yeah i've been trying to figure out what my passion is because i i tend to feel strongly about a lot of things but if you narrow it down it would probably be the human connection or yeah um something like that i think so yeah <laughs> and that's also why you know what is so cool the responsibility of acting which is just How can I be a vessel for what the st storytellers are trying to convey? And how can I do it in a way that can be received by the audience and be the communicate, the translator uh, of those emotions? Um, so I guess that's what I ended up doing. <laughs> I am very curious about those uh, A, H, B, next uh, futures uh, step because as you just mentioned uh, earlier um, you had some recordings in Canada so in North America so you had a sort of taste of it is it a part of your plan to expand and uh, maybe move in this region or do you want to stick in into uh, your uh, homeland and Scandinavia in general Hmm, I think I am a person who is best with a very predictable base and then an unpredict and then do unpredictable adventures when I have the chance. So I, th I think I will still keep my base in Sweden. Um, but I would love to spend, you know, a smaller amount of time, um, in any country, really. It's just, Yeah, I, I think you're, you'll learn so much and, and have incredible experiences wherever work or life puts you, um, if you're lucky enough. <laughs> or um, Yeah, if the preconditions are right, of course. Uh, as in the same time that you could have a horrible experience on a job abroad or in your hometown, um, depending on where the, the preconditions and the intentions are. Uh, of your coworkers and of the people, of your employee, and where you're with yourself. Um, so I don't have any any plans of uh, moving anywhere where uh, outside of Sweden. I got uh, an apartment in Stockholm last summer, and uh, yeah, I think this way of living is working for me for now. But we'll see. You never know. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amelia Om Butchke. Yeah, almost. <laughs> Bien almost, que. it's very um, good. <laughs> oh no, you know what? We, you know, I don't use it because it's so hard for foreigners to pronounce it. It's Bielke. Bielke. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me rephrase it. Okay, thank you very much, Amelia Holm Bielke. Thank you so much, Victor. <laughs> <laughs> This was a lovely talk. <laughs> 